Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house, you guys. Come on. Amen. We're in the second installment of this series called The Art of War, The Essentials of Spiritual Warfare. So today, what we're going to be talking about, if you missed last week, is important. We just went over Spiritual Warfare 101, kind of got some good understanding about the spiritual realm and spiritual warfare. But today, if there's an area of your life that you know that you're not free, that, you, that you're held back, that you are limited in any area of your life, it could be in your thought life or your relationships or in your habits, in any area, today what I want to do is to help you understand how you can be free in Jesus' name. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to show you how, and no matter what it is, it's, it, we're going to use the Word of God to help us chart a course towards freedom together. Here's what you need to understand, though. Demons are real. How many of you, how many of you believe this by now? Amen? Demons are real. The devil is real. And I'm not saying that to scare you or anything, but there's a reality that is happening. You have an enemy who desires to destroy you, who is actively at war to deceive, to divide, and to destroy. And we might enjoy the parts of our Christianity that are more of like connection with God part. But the reality is that there is another element or a part of your faith, not only connection with God, but confrontation with the enemy. And you need, and if you don't understand, if you're not aware of that, if you are not, then you'll never really be free. Okay, because yes, God wants you to connect with him, to have a relationship with him. This is what Jesus came to do, to, to build back, to, to make a redemption and propitiation that we're able to connect with God now once again through Jesus Christ. But there's also an enemy that we must confront that is, that is robbing, stealing, killing, and destroying. And how, did he, how does he do it? Not how you would think, how, you know, swords and weapons and things like, no, not, not by force of, of, of will like, like you would think. It's a different kind of war. So here's what spiritual warfare is. The biblical definition of spiritual warfare is this, and we give it to you every week, you guys. It's the fight to believe and obey God's truths over the other meaning's lies. That's it. It's, it's the fight to believe and obey something, to believe it and obey it. The truth that God says over the lies that the enemy is telling us, okay? Today, we're going to walk some things out on how to break some strongholds and get free. And there's so much in the scriptures that have to deal with this topic. In fact, in, um, in Jesus' ministry, when he, like his earthly ministry, when he started ministering, he began by, by declaring in like, in like the, the temple, declaring what he was there to do. And his ministry was described, the whole description, I'm going to read it to you, is a description of spiritual warfare. Because a lot of people thought, when the Messiah came, they thought he was going to come to build a physical kingdom. He was going to come as a, as a physical king, sit on the throne of David, and finally Israel would be free from their physical oppressors and rule as a powerhouse physically on the planet. And that's what they thought he would come do. But he didn't come to build a physical kingdom. He came to build and establish a spiritual kingdom. So this is what Jesus came to do. He came to advance the kingdom of God through spirit. So let me show it to you. Luke chapter 4, when Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he's actually in the temple and he, he gets a scroll from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61, and he reads this prophecy that was about his ministry. It was about the Messiah. Look what it says. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim what? Proclaim good news to the poor. Some of you in some translations, good news is actually translated the gospel. It's, that's what it means. The gospel is Good news. So, so proclaiming the gospel, listen to me, the first priority, and Jesus is going to give us other aspects of his spiritual war that he came to battle, but the first priority of spiritual warfare is proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, I know that with this topic, some of you are like, this topic of spiritual warfare, some of you are like, okay, pastor, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this, but I'll go there because I trust you. I'll go there, okay, okay. And so some of you are like that, and I've talked to some of you that are like, oh, I'm just uncomfortable with this, but, but okay, Pastor. So I'm, I'm thank you so much for allowing me to lead you through the word. But then there's others of you that are in a whole different camp that are fine. You guys are like, finally, let's go. It's finally about time that you, that you, you know. <laughs> so here's what you need to know. Listen to me, listen to me, please. No matter what camp that you find yourself in today, you need to hear this. The highest form of spiritual warfare 
is rescuing people from the dominion of darkness into God's marvelous light through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the highest form of spiritual warfare. So if you're here today and you're all about spiritual warfare, you're all about going for hopping from church to church to church, event to event to event, and you love huddling together with your 50 Christians and like and doing all the battle you want to do, but yet you're not rescuing souls, you're not powerful, you're a poser. Did I ruffle your feathers a little bit? Because I meant to, okay? Yeah, okay, because you because you think you think you're very powerful and spiritual. I'm telling you, at Discovery Church, we're gonna preach the whole counsel, the word of God. And some of you are like, it's about time we do this. No, you read your Bible. There is so much in there about everything, life and relationships. And, and so I'll do teachings on a on a book of the Bible or on relationships or on a character of the Bible. I will teach it all. It's all God's word. If you here at Discovery, we're gonna rescue people from the dominion of darkness into God's mark. Life. If you want to be that Christian that huddles together with 50 other Christians and does your spiritual kumbaya warfare stuff, go for it. But here at Discovery, we're going to advance the kingdom of God and get people saved. Okay? Now I'll get off my soapbox for a minute. That's just saying, Jesus said he came. This is the first priority of spiritual warfare to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Now, he wasn't talking about physical fi prisoners, was he? Because he wasn't coming to set physical people free. He wasn't establishing a physical kingdom. He, he's talking about people who were bound by the enemy. Proclaim freedom to prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind. Again, not just those who are physically blind, but those who are spiritually blind. Those who are not seeing, all there is to see, that there is a spiritual blindness. And I've been praying for this specifically today. Throughout this whole week, that God would open your eyes to see the spiritual realm. The things that you're missing because you're getting distracted by your eyesight. You're not seeing the spiritual eyes. Okay? Jesus said, I've come to do that. I've come that you would actually see stuff. That you see things you ain't seeing. I, I, to recover a sight that you are not yet beholding things. But I came so that you would behold and see what I need you to see. To set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now all of this, every, that is spiritual Warfare, the spiritual kingdom that Jesus came to establish and to advance. Acts 10 38 says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he, how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So Jesus had a ministry, and I, I don't want you to freak out over this word, but Jesus had a ministry of deliverance. Now, don't freak out over that word thing because some of you are like, oh, deliverance is for them. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's that group over there. But no, we all need deliverance. Everybody needs. We actually, that's what sanctification is. Sancti like this process of being sanctified and, and, and becoming more like Christ is a process of every single one of us need to experience freedom. Every one of us are on that journey. Let me say it this way. Every one of us has something that we need freedom from. Okay, so, so like 90% of what everyone else is dealing with, you're good. You're good. But like there is that, but there is that one area that keeps coming back. And you think you got it under control, and it comes back again. You know why? Because the enemy knows where to get you. The enemy knows where to, where to target. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So, so he is at work. He's seeking whom he may devour. We need to see with spiritual eyes to see that there's more behind it. Like, like, if all we address is the physical, we'll never really get healed. There's a spiritual that actually begins before it even becomes physical. Before it was a thought, it was in the spiritual. Before it came out of your mouth, there was something spiritual that, that produced that, the fruit of your words. In fact, in your notes, 2 Kings chapter 6 gives a really great example of, of the curtains of the heavenly realms being, being peeled back for us to see what we can't see with physical eyes. It says this. That when the servant of the man of God, speaking of Elisha, the prophet, he got up and went out early the next morning. An army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. What do you mean don't be afraid? There's two of us. There's armies all around us. Look what he says. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So if you can just open your eyes to see what God wants you to see, you would stop reacting to, to the enemy or the challenges or your opposition or the illnesses or the, the people around you because there are more with you than there are against you. 
And here's what he says. Elisha, open, pray this, open his eyes, Lord. And that's what I've been praying for. Open their eyes, Lord, so that they may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. There was this heavenly host of angel armies surrounding them. All that to say, listen, this life is a lot more spiritual than you realize. There's so much more that is happening that you cannot see. In fact, you've maybe heard people say, or maybe you've even said it, like, don't over-spiritualize it. You know, oh, you're over, you're over spiritualizing. I really don't think that's the problem, you guys. I think the problem is we we have an epidemic of under spiritualizing, because ain't nobody going to you saying, "Oh, you're praying too much." Oh, you pray, you're praying too much about that. Stop praying. This is you're over. Hey, stop reading the Bible. You read the Bible too much. You know too much of the Bible about that. You know, you're quoting too much of the Bible over that situation. That's not the problem you have. Let's be real. We're we need to. I think we need to over spiritualize a little bit more. I think we need to, because there is so much more spiritual than we realize. We're actually not just physical beings. We are eternal spiritual beings that are in temporary physical bodies. So, so I think we need to over-spiritualize it just a little bit more than we realize. Because, you know, not every thought that you have even came from you. Do you realize this? Sometimes those thoughts that you have that you let kind of sit in your mind, you're meditating on that stuff. Some of those thoughts were actually fiery arrows of the enemy that came, that were shot at you to deceive, to destroy, and to divide. Let me give you some examples, not in your notes. First Chronicles chapter 21 says that Satan stood against Israel and incited David or influenced David to number Israel. He added them all up. Now, here's why that was probably a bad thing for him to do. You might not be aware of this, but, but as king of Israel, he was supposed to put his trust in God, not his armies. And so what he did by numbering all of Israel, he wanted to make sure that he had enough people to either advance or defend against the opposition. So the motivation came from a place of fear and mistrust. The scripture says that that didn't just come from him. That didn't come from him. Satan influenced him to make a decision to number the armies of Israel because of fear and mistrust in his God. First King chapter 22, let me give you another example. It says that the Lord had put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these false prophets. The Lord has decreed, he said, disaster for you. Now you may see scriptures like this, especially in the Old Testament, where it says that the Lord sent the spirit or something like that. It should be interpreted in the context of allowing the spirit. That the Lord allowed a spirit. The actual original language of this Hebrew text, it says a lying spirit. That there was allowed, that God allowed a lying spirit to get into some of these false prophets. So you thought that you just gossip because you have a problem with gossip. You thought you, you, you stretched the truth just a little bit. You kind of get your way with little white lies here and there. Maybe you have a lying spirit. Am I ruffling some feathers? I just, I'm just trying for you to, I just want you to see that it's more spiritual than you realize. Um, remember when Peter denied Jesus three times? That was, that was more than just weakness. And him being, you know, not wanting to get crucified and punished and judged just like Jesus was. It was more than that. It was spiritual. Jesus actually tells us where it came from, Luke chapter 22. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, which is his other name. That's Peter's other name, same person. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I prayed for you, Simon, so that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, because he is going to, He's going to lie to you and get you. I've already seen it. I'm the beginning and the end. But when you come back, make sure you strengthen your brothers because they're going to need you, Simon. So, so it wasn't just a denial of Jesus out of his own flesh. We're told by Jesus that that was actually spiritual warfare from Satan himself that came against Peter too, probably because of fear of judgment and, and, and lack and doubt that, that he denied Jesus. So it wasn't just, no, 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 it was actually spiritual. That was spiritual warfare that was happening there. There is some infirmities and illnesses that can be caused in our life through open doors and legal access that we've given the enemy. Let me show you an example. Luke chapter 13. It says on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And, and I'm going to again call out, I know every third service I do this, I'm going to call out the ACs. Just, uh, it feels like I'm doing this every time. I'm so hot up here. I don't know if it's because of summer or what, but help me out, bro. Luke chapter 13 says this, on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there 
who had been crippled, look what it says, by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. A lot of theologians believe it's something like something in her back, bone, something like that. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. And check this out. You go read the story. The Pharisees and the religious people were so mad that he, that he actually healed her on the Sabbath. And they're just like such a religious group that it's just like they're more focused on the rules and the processes and the procedures. I'm like, wait, like, you know, we're not supposed to act like that. And Jesus is like, are you kidding me? And then this, she was, she's, so here's what he says. Should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? So, so there are, now look, I'm not saying, you know, the boogeyman is under every rock. That's not what I'm saying, okay? But I am saying it's more spiritual than you realize. In fact, everything physical begins first spiritual. And I think as a child of God, I truly believe we need to be over spiritual than we are physical. We should be responding to spiritual things more and first as a priority before you respond in the natural. Are y'all with me? Do you guys see this? Okay. God, open our eyes to see with spiritual discernment that we would have an increased awareness to the, to the battle, the battle in the unseen world, in places, and principalities, in heavenly realms. So how do we, if there's areas of our life that are not free, that we're not experiencing freedom, um, how do we break the strongholds? How do we break free? Let, let me show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. So whether you're engaging in office, the war of office politics, the war of your family drama, the war of, no matter, whatever that is, we don't, we don't fight like they fight. You don't fight them. You don't fight like the office fights. You don't fight like the in-laws fight. You don't fight like they fight. You don't, you don't do it that way. You don't do it the world's way. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And I don't know what that area is for you. Like I said, it's just, there's an area. For every person I've discovered, there's, a, there's areas and weaknesses the enemy, the enemy knows. Like, like, you know, it could be your spending or your lust or your insecurity or your thoughts. I don't know what it is, but you have an area that just hasn't broke yet. You haven't received breakthrough yet. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Let me tell you this. Let me prophesy this over some of you. There is, there is a truth that God has about you that you have yet to believe. That you're actively even resisting. You're like, I just don't see that. I don't see it in me. I can't receive that. And, and, and there's, there's this area. He, he's, he's got a way that he sees you that you don't see you, and you need to be able to see it in Jesus' name for you to be free. Okay? These demolish arguments and pretensions that set itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So what is a stronghold? By, by Paul's definition here, as he uses it, because a stronghold is a fortress or a fortified place. But Paul tells us that this is, this is a tool or, or a description of the enemy. What is it? A stronghold is a prisoner locked by deception. Like it feels like it has power, but it really doesn't. The power that it does have, listen to me, the only power that it does have is because the power that I've given it by believing in it, I came under it. Okay, this is the, the spiritual realm and heavenly places, the heavenly realms, they operate by faith. Whether faith in God or faith in lies. Amen, Pastor. Okay. So you think it has more power in your life than it actually does. It's living life by something that is not true. It's not true. But you've become convinced that it's true. You know, a good, a good analogy of this is, is how they train elephants. Like for circuses and stuff. A baby elephant at, at a young age, they chain the elephant he can't break free. He's so small. But as that elephant grows, they actually remove the chains and they just put ropes, sometimes a tiny rope on a wooden stake in the ground. And if you've ever gone to the circus and you've seen these big behemoth elephants held by a rope and a wooden stake in the ground, you wonder, that can't hold them. There's no way. That thing can break free of that. Here's the thing, though. He can break free, but he doesn't know he can See, some of you can break free, but you don't believe that you can be free. 
So, so the elephant, listen to me, guys, the elephant is not held captive by the chain. He's held captive by the lie. The devil has power, yes, but he doesn't have authority. Jesus gave it to you. He is the higher name. But here's the truth you need to write down or something, guys. When you believe the lie, you empower the liar. The power he has is the power that you believe that you've surrendered, that you've given him. When you buy into it, the power and the authority that he doesn't have is given to him by faith. That's how he has it. So if there's some strongholds in our life that usually develop, we usually have certain symptoms that we can see from strongholds in our life. So let me just expose a few symptoms that you might have that would reveal a stronghold maybe in your life. Strongholds steal our focus. They rob us of focus. Like you're trying to concentrate on things, but your mind is consumed by other things. You can't concentrate. You can't focus. A, a, a sign or a symptom of strongholds is where you're so distracted all the time. Strongholds cause us to feel controlled. In fact, the enemy does this by making you believe that is who you are. So you're not just, you don't just have a problem with drinking. You are an alcoholic. Okay, he wants that to become your identity. Like, oh, I just I can't get away from this. It's just who I am. That's a lie. That's that's a symptom of a stronghold. You feel controlled by it, or strongholds consume our emotional energy. So you'll have feelings of hopelessness, of depression. You'll feel emotionally drained all the time. And I'm not speaking about like introverts that spend more too much time with people and you feel like emotionally drained and you're like okay i need to get away from people for a little bit i'm not i'm not speaking about that i'm talking about like like you have this inward battle so much like the battle in your mind a battle inside of your soul that you're fighting thoughts you're fighting fears you're fighting worries and doubts and inner struggles so much by the end of the day you're like i just can't just i just need to i need to get away i can't even talk to people anymore that is a sign or a symptom of a stronghold operating in our life. Or probably a big one for us is that strongholds distract us from our purpose. And so if you're a child of God here, you love God, listen to me. The devil doesn't care that you're going to heaven. He can't do nothing about that. I mean, here's, what he, here's what he doesn't want now, though. He just wants to make sure you don't bring anybody else with you. Okay, so he's like, I lost them. Okay, I lost them. But if I can get them locked in to this stronghold, so focused in on this and not the kingdom of God, they'll never do anything in their life that matters. They'll get so focused on other things. Every time they pray, they'll pray about themselves. They'll never pray for people. They'll never pray for the world. So every time they come to church, it will always be about, be about them. If I can just get them so distracted on their own struggles, their own issues, and up in their mind, then they'll never live a life that amounts to anything or makes a difference in this world. He'll rob you of your purpose. And if you, today you are having this symptom where it's all about you, it's all about your issues and your trials and stuff, that is a symptom of a stronghold operating in your life if you're not living by God's purpose. Or here's the last one, a good symptom is that it robs us of an abundant life and even as i say that an abundant life some of you are like you just lost all belief that that's even possible you're like well that's but that's the problem pastor i just i'm not i'm struggling i'm in pain i'm in survival mode look i'm not just like i'm not trying to like hype you up like hyper preacher kind of thing listen to me god has abundant life available for you jesus said i have come that they might have life and have it to the full. You can't give up on that. Don't give up on the idea of why Jesus even came to present you with life. Listen to me. Joy is yours to the full. Victory is yours to the full. Freedom is yours to the full. It is, it is absolutely yours. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I love this. He says they, they will come to their senses like, wake up. Don't buy into the, uh, the reality of the enemy or this world and escape the evil trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So how do we do that? How do we escape this trap? How do we escape the lie? How do we escape these strongholds? Get freedom. Jesus actually described this process of freedom, of how it works. He told a parable about a strong man and how we actually can break free. Let me show it to you in two different gospels, two different accounts of it. Let me show you the first one. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Jesus says again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house? And this is a, a parable that he's, he's telling about strongholds. He's just saying it's a strong man. How can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions 
unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. That there's this strong man, this strong holding guard, keeping you, preventing you from accessing the riches of the glorious inheritance in Christ. What if there's this strong man that, that, is, that is preventing you from stepping into what God wants to do? Look at here, look at Luke chapter 11, the same story told from a different perspective of another apostle. It says, when a strong man, armed to the teeth, stands guard in his front yard, his property is safe and sound. But I love this question. But what if a stronger man comes along with superior weapons? What if a stronger man comes with divine power? Then he's beaten at his own game. The arsenal that gave him such confidence hold, hauled off, and his precious possessions plundered. Now, Jesus was teaching here on the process of deliverance, of breaking strongholds. And this is actually what this whole series is about. It's what we're doing every day. It's what we're walking through is breaking strongholds and experiencing freedom. So let me, from a big, strongholds are broken uh, with four steps. Every stronghold. I'm going to give them to you, and then we can walk them out every day and throughout these series. But if you want to break strongholds and experience freedom, you got to do number one. You have to take back your thought life. You have to take back dominion and control of your thoughts. There are some things that you're allowing into your thoughts that you are allowing to swirl, to meditate, to focus on, that, that don't belong there. It's occupying space. You spend time and you get caught in this thought and you waste so much time in it until someone snaps you. Like, Man, what was, I, what, was I, what was I thinking? There are some thoughts you got to get control over. And in order to do that, you probably have to limit things that are accessing or influencing your thoughts. You probably have to set up some safeguards, especially if, 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 you're, if this is hitting your soul right now and you know. You probably need to like stop watching the news or as much or get off of social media or put down the phone a little bit. Stop watching certain programming. Stop hanging out with certain people because, you know, every time you're around them, you digress. You don't get higher. You go lower, okay? And some people I know you can't get away from because you work with them. Or you sleep with them. No, I'm just kidding. Or, but, but you got to set up some boundaries. Okay, here's the deal. Because you're asking God to heal you, but you keep holding on to thoughts that are killing you. So, so that, that's not going to work. You'll never be free until you change the way you think. You'll never be free. And the only thing that 2 Corinthians tells us that we do to demolish strongholds is take captive thoughts. That's what he says. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. It's the battle to believe and obey God's truth over the enemy's lies. We take captive thoughts. We have to take our thought life back. In fact, there's another verse, Romans chapter 8, that says a very similar thing. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature. In other words, you're doing stuff that when you're doing, you're doing, you're like, you have this attitude, you have this habit, you have angers and hates and lusts, and you do it, and you think, dang it, why do I keep doing that? Here's why. You, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, look what they do. They think, they control their thinking. They've taken back their thought life about things that please the Spirit. So if your sinful nature controls your mind, if you give it that space and you're not taking captive the thoughts, He will continue to produce death in your life. Death in your emotions, in your dreams, in your relationships. So many areas He'll pr produce death and destruction. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is life and peace. And so what we've done in this series and is, is like every day, what I'm hoping to do is give you a quantum leap of the Holy Spirit, man, to flood your mind, your feed, just with the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God, that you'd, He'd start to rewire some things and you would start to feel life and peace like you've never experienced before. Another verse, Romans 12 and 2. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. So don't live the world's way. Don't do it like the world. Don't run your business like the world runs their business, okay? Don't, don't lead people the way that the world leads people. Don't, don't parent the way the world parents. Don't, don't do relationships the way the world does relationships. Don't date like the world dates. I told my kids, man, as they were getting into high school, I'm like, you're going to have crushes. It's going to happen. I get it. But please, do me a favor. Just do me a favor. Wait a little bit. Let your knucklehead friends go first and see if you want the same thing. Just watch, watch what happens, because they'll be in love, and then they'll hate the fool, and then date his friend, and then hate and gossip about him, too. It'll just, it'll just all, 
Just watch it. Don't copy. Come on, somebody. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person. This is how. Look what he says. This is how. By changing the way you think. This is, this is how we win. This is how warfare is done. Spiritual warfare. You got to take your thoughts back. You're never going to change your, your, you'll never be free until you change the way you think. Number two, we have to identify the lie now. When I say the lie, remember that's the stronghold. It's the deception. It's the place where the enemy has a stronghold in our life that we're buying into something. So where is the lie, the area of our life that the enemy has gripped us? And in this series, actually months ago, I was, I was going to preach and teach on like specific strongholds, like the main strongholds that I believe in our culture, most of us are dealing with and a large, so I was going to be like, okay, generational curses. Let's talk about generational curses. We're going to break this thing. That's something that people don't realize and how they can break free from stuff that were passed on to them. Sexual sins and all, that's in our culture. I was going to hit on a lot of these things, but as I was studying, I got to 18 strongholds. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a long series. It's going to be, but, but, which is fine. I'm okay. I've done long series before. If the Holy Spirit tells me to, I'll do it. But I felt like there were some things that we need to go to, and there's some things that God is doing here in the body of Christ that I know God wants me to also deliver, to teach, to lead us in. I know it. I know it. So I just, God, what do you want me to do? You want me to change? I'll change it. I've done that before. But I felt like, like, like what I, God told me, no, you're going to give these 18, but you're going to give it in the same timeline. So we've never done this before, but in 21 days of prayer, usually, we usually, Pastor Veronica and I go online, but we usually have breaks in this. We're not doing any, we're like every day, Monday through Saturday. So after Sunday, from Monday through Saturday, Pastor Veronica and I are going on live and it's being recorded and then it's stored on our website and it's stored online and we're going over the 18 top strongholds that need to be demolished in Jesus' name. Okay, we just felt led by the Holy Spirit to just go, like to press in, you guys, for your freedom. Let me give you, because this is part of the series. I got so much content, I just can't cover it in, in like four weeks, you guys. So let me give you the website up here. If you guys are on the lower third down here, the website that we're archiving all these is ilovediscovery.church slash art of war. Here's the six that we just went over that you should go watch. If you're serious about this and you want to go on a journey to freedom, then go watch these ones and join me this week. We covered double-mindedness, the stronghold of double-mindedness, the stronghold of rejection and rebellion, lust and perversion, guilt and condemnation, and the stronghold of fear. Okay, next week, starting tomorrow, let me show you where we're going. We're going to talk about bitterness and unforgiveness, a huge stronghold in people's lives, unforgiveness, pride, witchcraft, and occult. Talk to you about that in just a moment, actually. Religious spirit, depression, and confusion. Okay, here's why, here's why we need to address these strongholds, these deceptions, these lies that we need to target these things. John 8, says, when the devil lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when you believe the lie, you empower the liar. But check this out. When, you, when we expose the lie, we defeat the liar. We got to expose that thing. We got to identify, hey, where is that, where's that coming from? Where do, where's that lie? What am I believing that's against the word of God? I was reading in, in, from another resource about these four doors that every stronghold comes through. Every stronghold is developed in our life through one of four categories or four doors. Let me give them to you. The first door is fear, okay? When you have thoughts of fear that come, maybe it's unbelief, need to control things because of fear, anxiety, isolation, even apathy and drug and alcohol use can be because of our fear. When we do that, when we allow fear to manifest and remain in our thoughts, listen to me, you're opening a door of legal access to the enemy. You're giving him room. You're saying, okay, I'm going to believe you of what you say about this instead of what God says. And you're giving him legal access and room in your life. Fear is a way of changing our focus from God to our problems. It just has a way of us, we, instead of putting faith in God's promises, we start to put faith in our feelings and all throughout scripture we are commanded not to fear but for one reason you know what it is because god is with us god is with us that's the promise that god gives us to combat fear perfect love casts out fear it's an open door that we can give to the enemy here's the second door hatred so when you're motivated by hate bitterness envy and gossip and slander and anger Hatred, self-hatred, all these things, when you act out that, what the enemy wants to isolate and divide you, that is an open door 
of demonic attack and strongholds in your life. How about sexual sin? Through so many open doors, adultery and pornography and fornication, lewdness and molestation, rape. You know, this is one of the, the areas in the Bible that you're never told throughout Scripture, never told to fight against sexual sin. You're always told to run away from sexual sin. You don't fight this. You get away from it. You flee sexual sin. It's one of the most powerful strong men that Jesus was talking about. One of the most powerful strong men is sexual sin. And, and the reason is, it's not because that's an area of the enemy that he's made it strong. Here's, here's why. Because God has made it strong. God created sex intentionally powerful. I know it got PG-13. I'm really sorry, but check it out, you guys. Sex is powerful, okay? And God created it with power. The intention was to create oneness between a man and a woman in marriage, that they would create a oneness that could not be created, a soul oneness through this act of intimacy sexually. The enemy knows this, and he has targeted a very powerful tool of blessing that God has given us, twisted it to make it toxic to cause strongholds in our life. When we illegitimately, instead of legitimate sex, we illegitimately use sex and create strong, strongholds. We, so you just need to know it's more than physical, guys. Ladies, you're getting on the internet, you're watching, I mean, it's everywhere, it's on your phone, it's the access, but when you do that, I, just picture it, every time you do it, you're opening the door to the devil. You're opening the door to demonic attack and strongholds. You're giving him legal access, legal right, he has no right, no right to cause any havoc or chaos in your life, in your mind, in your family, but when you open the door, you welcome it, okay? So it's more than physical, it's more than that. How about this one? This last one is occult and witchcraft. Fortune telling, tarot cards, mediums we go to, Ouija boards, manipulation, covens and curses and all these things. You may think that witchcraft is so far away from your zip code, but listen to me. Paul told Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3, he told them, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? He said, man, you're, hey, church, you're under a spell. That someone, someone puts you under that you, removes you from the truth of God. Who's bewitched you? Okay, so let me give you a definition of witchcraft. We're actually going to be studying this uh, this week online as part of one of our strongholds. But let me give you a definition of witchcraft. Witchcraft is the attempt to control a person or make them do what you want them to do through use of anything other than the Holy Spirit. Witchcraft is the attempt to control a person to get them to do what you want them to do by using anything except for the Holy Spirit. Okay, now it got a little bit closer to home now. Witchcraft did, didn't it? Okay, so we'll talk about that and how, how we opening access to these spirits into our life. So we're going to take back our thought life. We've got to identify the specific stronghold and lie. Number three, now we've got to close the door. We've we got to close the door. The enemy operates, remember, through legal access, open doors, where we accept it. Somewhere in our life, we said we welcomed it. We gave it agreement and assent. And so it was, it, we opened. Uh, Ephesians says it's a, it's a, we gave him an open door or a foothold in our life, okay? So what do we do? How do we close the door? 1 John 1, 19 says, if we confess our sins. How do you close the door? You confess it. You confess your sins. He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Well, we close the door by making confession. Close. So let me give you the sequence, not in your notes, but I'm going to lead you through this this week, and I'd love for you to do this yourself as you are walking this out with the strongholds in your life really quickly. What do you, what do, you do? Well, you ask yourself, is the door open? Where's the door? And then when was the first time the door was open? You have to go back to the place where it originated, the origination of when you opened the door, when you bought into that lie. And then in that place, you got to forgive the person who opened the door. Because, look, if you don't forgive the person that helped you open that door, and then you just deal with the issue, then that person that opened the door, the enemy could use that to create access again in your life. You have to forgive the person that helps you open the door. What, and then you ask, what's the lie I'm believing that's keeping the door open? You have to renounce that lie and then discover the truth of God's word and declare it over your life. And you ask Jesus to help seal the door with his blood. This is the sequence to close the door. Identify the lie, okay? We have to take back our thoughts, identify the stronghold, close the door. Then number four, replace the lie with God's truth. 
Listen to me, church. There is nothing too difficult for God. Come on. Do you believe that, you guys? Well, I don't know, man. See, this problem, it's always been, and I've always, no, no, no. I was born this way. No, no, no. Listen to me. Nothing is impossible with God. Actually, Luke 1, 37 says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. There is nothing more powerful than our God. Fear is not more powerful than God. Sexual sin, no sexual sin is more powerful than our God. No hurt or hatred or habit or demonic forces of evil are more powerful than our God. You know, you look up Luke 137, actually in the, in the Greek, you know, text that it was written. When you see the word nothing, when you look at the Greek in that, you know what that translates? This is so profound. Nothing translates as nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. No, but this one, no, no, no. I was, I've always been, and my family's always been. No, no, listen to me, that's a lie. Nothing is more powerful than God. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We'll probably study that in this series a little bit, the full armor of God. You know, the, all the armor pieces, most of those are defensive pieces. They are defensive pieces of armor because you are constantly being attacked by the enemy. But then he gives us two. I want, well, actually, I think there's two. There's two other weapons he gives us. Look what it says. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray. So how do we replace the lie with the truth? We take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we pray. So write this down. How do we replace the, the lie with the truth? Write this down. The Word of God. Through the Word of God. Some of you, some of you are like, man, I'm tired of milk, Pastor. I want some, I want some meat. I want some meat. How many of you, you ever? I want the meat of the Word of God, Pastor. Listen to me. Your mama gave you milk, but you have to hunt to go get meat. Some of you are looking for like. I'm, look, I'm going to teach the whole council of the Word of God here, right? I'm going to be led by the Spirit. I'm going to teach you the Word of God. But, but I don't want to just put meat on your table. I want to teach you how to go hunt for your own meat, okay? You have access to the Word of God, and you need to learn how to devour and feed yourself the meat of the Word of God instead of just being spoon-fed the Word. you got a pantry full of, of ingredients and and material, you got on, the top shelf is Genesis, the bottom shelf is Revelation, and there's amazing ingredients in between. You got access to it all. You need to feed yourself the Word of God. I love the Word of God. You know, this is what the enemy is after. The enemy is actually after the Word of God in your life. He wants to steal it. You know why? Because it's the truth. It's the truth that, you're, that God wants you to believe. It's the only truth that can overcome the lie. So Jesus actually told a parable about this, about the story of the farmer, the sower, and the seeds. He said this, the farmer scatters the seeds. And then and, and, and some on different soils. But remember what he said? He said the bird comes and snatches the seed off the soil. And then he interprets the parable for the disciples. And he actually says the bird is Satan. Well, see, what that's what the enemy does. The, the bird is after the book. Oh, no, no, you, you don't know how to read that Bible. It's too difficult for you. You're too tired. You can't understand. You're not smart enough. Let me just take that. Let me just, let me just, let me just. He just, he wants not, if, listen, if you don't get into your Bible, the enemy is going to get in your business. Look, this is, this is the offensive weapon that, 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 that God has given you, the sword of the spirit that is the word of God. And then he says, and write this down, pray. Pray. If you don't pray, you'll stray, okay? You got to pray. And don't just, don't just pray and don't just read the Bible, but pray the Bible. Pray the word of God of God. Some of you are still stuck in now I lay me down to sleep stuff. You know what I mean? Lord bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. You know, it's the only time you like, you actually you commune with God through prayer. Come on, man. Like prayer is so much more than that. Prayer is a weapon. It's a weapon. And if we're battling spiritual forces, then where do you think we do battle? In prayer. We don't do battle in natural. Let me end with this story. I was actually um, watching this documentary a while ago called The Elizabeth Smart Story. Y'all seen that? The Elizabeth Smart Story. This 14-year-old girl was abducted in the middle of the night from her home at Knife Point from this, this crazy guy, David Mitchell. He, he thought he was a prophet or God. Just, you know, he had a demon is what he had, you guys. And he just kidnaps this 14-year-old girl, takes her out to the wilderness. For nine months, he rapes her every day. It's a horrible thing. But after like a couple of weeks in the wilderness and him lying to her, 
he got the confidence to take her out in public with him. He put a veil on her, and they would walk around, and she wouldn't say a thing. In fact, in the documentary, it explained that they were in the public library at one point with other people all around, and a police officer comes up to them, and he has the picture of Elizabeth Smart. And he goes, have you seen this girl? And she knows that's her. She's just one cry away from her deliverance, one moment away, and she would have been set free. Yet, she was convinced that this man had the power to not only kill her, but kill that policeman, kill everybody, if she were to try to break free. She wasn't held captive by him anymore. She was held captive by the lie. And some of you are so close to your freedom so close you have all the authority of God all the divine power that you need you just got to believe it again and I hope part of the series is not just the, the all, theological to explain things to you to understand but I hope to stir your faith that you would believe God's truth that freedom is yours it's your right that the enemy has no right to wreak havoc and destruction in your life in your mind in your body or in your family in Jesus name Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.